we'll get started because we don't have uh, a lot of time. Um, we have a packed agenda and lots of you are joining us today. Um, it's great that you can. And thank you so much for attending. My name is Rajiv Ranjan, and I am the Innovation Team Lead and Technical Program Advisor at the Paris 21. Paris 21 um, is a partnership hosted at the OECD. The partnership uh, promotes better use and production of statistics throughout the developing world. I'm so proud to invite you and welcome you to this event today on a data uh, flow analysis framework, or BFAF as we call it. Um, before we uh, start, uh, just a couple of housekeeping um, uh, stuff, which I'm sure you all are familiar uh, with by now. Uh, there is a chat and a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, please uh, submit your questions for the panelists via the Q&A uh, function. Uh, we are also recording this webinar, but um, none of your videos will be uh, on during the event, except also, of course, uh, for the speakers. Um, we already have around um, 79 um, uh, of you in the audience so far. So great to see you all here and from a wide range of backgrounds. And we are really pleased to be able to convene this kind of uh, an audience. So we are here today to answer the question about how national statistical offices can optimize performances of their uh, data portals which host uh, particularly indicators. So this is an important and timely conversation as we all know that despite heavy investments in information technology, the improvements have not been consistent and then uniform across uh, countries and then processes as well. So this guideline, uh, this uh, framework, I hope you all have had the opportunity to uh, at least uh, browse through is available on the Paris 21's website. And it is a joint publication between the OECD and Paris 21. And uh, it has been reviewed by many uh, experts, including um, from Statistics Sweden uh, before its publication. Um, I'm sure you had a chance uh, to look at the agenda. Um, and first, um, we have Francois Fontenou, the deputy head of Paris 21, who will uh, introduce uh, the DFAF or the framework. And after that, uh, we will have a panel discussion moderated by Jonathan. Uh, who is a partnership and community manager for the SISCC. I will not go into the detail about what SISCC is, um, but uh, he'll, he'll introduce that uh, himself. Um, he works with OECD. Um, he will also uh, um, undertake uh, the question and answer um, aspects after the uh, panel. And uh, finally, um, Eric Anwar, uh, who is the head of smart data practice and solutions at the OECD will uh, do the wrap up and uh, also uh, make some closing uh, remarks. With that, uh, Francois, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rajiv. Um, my name is Francois Fontenot. I'm the deputy head in Paris and uh, It's my pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to this uh, virtual meeting. I can see Asia, Africa, America, all Europe and the Pacific, right? There was a chat from Samoa. So uh, fantastic to have everyone connected for, for the official launch of the DFAF, right, Rajiv? I think it's uh, the, the official launch. Nothing is official in this world, but the launch of the DFAF, we make it official. So A, A stands for analysis. I used to call DFAF assessment. And I was reminded by our colleagues that this was an analytical framework. Uh, which actually reflects very much the very nice story behind the DFAF, the guidelines. And um, if there are two lessons to be learned, one is the fact that these guidelines actually uh, came to life after uh, a, an attempt to respond to very practical uh, problems from Cambodia and from another set of countries relating to making uh, indicators accessible and, and, and share uh, their own data. So uh, it's not Paris 21 and, and the OECD scratching their heads to try to, to, to impose or, or put out a new set of guidelines. It's really a collective effort. And that's the second, second message here. Uh, it was really a collective uh, uh, solution brought together by UNICEF, UNSD, the Paris 21 Secretariat, 
and the OECD to come together around these uh, very practical problems which uh, NSOs were facing. So, you know, grounded on, on the practical issues of, of some of our NSOs, uh, collective effort, I think we have two, two very nice recipes for a, a very meaningful set of guidelines. Uh, the peer review process, which Rajiv mentioned, include uh, you know, excellent uh, collaboration with many of the institutions which are represented on this, on this panel here. And I'd like to, to thank everyone again for, for, for making their, their time for this panel. Um, and, and very quickly, in a nutshell, I mean, these DFAF are important because they basically address one of the, the, the biggest issues which NSOs are facing how to leverage the growing digitalization of societies and digitalization of, of NSOs' practices while at the same time. Um, uh, embarking all the agencies of, of the national statistical systems on, on smooth progress. So it's a piece of guidelines which um, actually provides avenues to improve on modernization of, of NSOs and leverage on the opportunities of, of digitalization of government and societies. I think we all agree in this group that uh, a sound common infrastructure for our statistical processes is needed. Uh, the SISCC has been talking for, 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 for quite some time on this uh, statistical backbone, you know, the, the IT backbone for the, for the national statistical system. In many countries, we are very far from this. Uh, we did a, a study in Paris 21, which showed that on the poorest countries, you know, what we call IDAC countries, those poor countries where NSOs and NSS tend to be the, the less developed. One third of, of these countries, actually the NSOs uh, were not, the NSOs websites were not mapped to proper uh, data portals. So that shows the extent of the challenges ahead of us. Uh, we can, you know, we can uh, discuss at length the beauties of data modeling, SDMX. Still, we have to make sure that, that no one is left behind. And I, I, it's my humble opinion opinion that this DFAF can make a difference. What it does in practice, um, and, and again, the panelists will share their, their views on, on, the, on the beauties of the methodologies, but it starts from assessing the, the flows, the, the models behind the indicators which are produced in an agency or a system. And then from this situation, we'd unpack the, 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 you know, the, the, the practices and the, the modeling in the back. And at some point, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll fall on some non-digital processes. And that's really the frontier which the DFAF uh, proposed to advance, how much pushback we want on the paper industry and how much uh, improved digital practices we want to enforce. So the guidelines would take it from there and propose a, a set of recommendations for very concrete recommendations, both quite nitty gritty attached to some specific indicators or processes and some high level which can be very well em embarked into you know, midterm planning processes, such as the NSDS processes, which uh, Paris 21 uh, is advocating for. So I won't uh, unpack uh, too much the, the beauties of the DFAF. I think you are the experts and you know this uh, and you'll be more convincing than, uh, than I can be. Uh, just to uh, remind everyone that uh, we as a small team in Paris 21 and together with our uh, partners here, UNSD, UNICEF, uh, the OECD uh, are open to engage further with uh, anyone who has a need to, to, to get advanced support on, on the use of these guidelines. Um, we have a program of work this year which allows for some resources on this, on this regard, and, and you should feel free to contact us if you, if you have some needs. Um, with this, Rajiv, I'd like to, to thank again uh, all of our panelists for their, for their time and commitment, and thank all the, the participants for, for taking their time to, to listen and hopefully share uh, very good ideas for further improving these guidelines. So thanks everyone, uh, over to you Rajiv. Thank you Francois. Uh, this was a very good presentation uh, about uh, the guideline itself, uh, how the framework uh, looks at the problem and uh, tries to address um, the solution um, uh, step by step. Uh, 
Um, I think uh, the panel members that we have today um, would throw um, much deeper um, kind of insights uh, into how uh, this process is realized in, in, in uh, kind of real situations. Um, this work is also um, a result of a long um, series of pilots that we all have engaged uh, in and, and uh, the panel members represent uh, that group of people. So um, without further ado, uh, let me uh, call upon uh, Jonathan. Um, please um, um, take us through the panel discussion um, that you have planned for us. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rajiv. So uh, I'm very pleased to be able to moderate this exciting panel to discussion today. And we have uh, some distinguished guests with us. Uh, you can see them on screen. Um, for what is really an important topic, as, as Francois outlined there at the beginning. So my name is Jonathan Chalon. I'm the Partnerships and Community Manager for the SACC at um, the OECD, uh, working within the Statistics and Data Directive. So before, maybe before I introduce the panel and just to build on what Francois was saying, I would like to sort of um, share a little of how we got to where we are today and, and the first publication of, of the DFAF guidelines. So firstly, uh, I want to highlight some uh, case studies that we undertook and, and really helped to uh, create these guidelines and help, help shape what, what you can see on, on the, uh, that's published on the Paris 21 website today. So in, in 2017, um, under um, the uh, Statistics and Data Director of the OECD, we first took a mission to, um, to Tunisia, where we, under the uh, MENA Transition Fund project, to build a statistical dissemination infrastructure to support um, their reporting capabilities and strategic priorities. Um, we, we undertook a study and, and understanding exactly uh, what we're talking about today, which is uh, data flow and um, you know, how the data flows through an organization and what are the practices and, and um, activities that happen and, and, and uh, allow for that to happen. Um, this has actually led to uh, the Institute for National Statistics in Tunisia to adopt standard, uh, standardized data modeling practices and tools, such as the open source platform mm -hmm. Suite, mm -hmm. as well as modernizing uh, technology that supports uh, the environment uh, with, with, with which the uh, data or producers of data are working with. Uh, this was followed by an 18-month pilot that uh, we undertook in Cambodia that was led by UNICEF. Uh, and jointly undertook with, uh, with the OECD, Paris 21, and uh, UNSD. This was um, com um, consisted of four workshops from March 2018 through to May 2019. And then uh, over three days in September 2019, the OECD and Paris 21 um, conducted a joint analysis of data flows with the Ghana statistical services. And then this was shortly also followed by a, a similar exercise in Thailand uh, with the National Statistical Office of Thailand, that was, again was led by UNICEF and with the support of the OECD to, to carry out uh, analysis of the data flows there. So I'm very pleased to have a number of uh, those people that were actually involved in this, uh, this journey with us today as, as the panel members. And um, without further ado, let me introduce these panel members to you. So first, uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Samuel uh, Kabina Anin. He's the government statistician for Ghana, uh, professor of economics at the University of Cape Coast of Ghana, and he's also a um, he has approximately about twenty years of teaching experience in universities, both in Ghana and abroad, and has more than forty peer-reviewed journal articles, book chapters, and technical reports uh, that are published. He provides professional advice and oversight responsibility for Ghana's national development plan and statistical ecosystem, and also several international bodies that work with Ghana. Next, we have uh, Ms. Uh, Hanatai Shanak, I hope I pronounced your name correctly there, um, who is currently the Director of Statistical Forecasting Division for the National Statistics Office of Thailand. Her responsibilities include overseeing the production of indices on social economic aspects, also the complementation and integration of statistics from various agencies within the Thai statistical um, system. Uh, and this also includes dissemination and information services. And in earlier roles, um, uh, Ms. Hanachai also was an inspector responsible for coordinating the work of the provincial offices and uh, director of 
Statistical Systems Management Division. And next, uh, I introduce um, Yves Jacques, who is a data-driven uh, software developer and product manager with experience in uh, various domains, such as uh, fast fashion, uh, fisheries, having, having worked previously at the um, FAO in, in Rome. Uh, he also has several years running a big data team for retail analytics in New York City. And since uh, around mid-2018, he's also been delivering uh, a key project, uh, the Helix project uh, for UNICEF, um, as, uh, that's been uh, investment by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This is to deploy open data tools and standards to support the agency's global public indicators. And then last but not least, we have uh, Ad Abdullah uh, Gozolov, who's a statistician at United Nations Statistics Division. He has designed and developed many statistical information systems and for the last 10 years has focused on XDMX capacity development projects with national statistics offices. And Abdullah is also the UNSD's focal point on XDMX and coordination for working on the XDMX for SDG indicators. So that's our panel members, and um, I'm very happy to, to be chairing or facilitating this panel with you. So maybe let's jump straight in uh, to, uh, to keep to time. And um, if Professor Anna, if I can ask you the first question, um, uh, the Ghana Statistical Services were an important or played an important part in, in this project to, to define the, the guidelines. And we're uh, very thankful for your organizational leadership and also support on this, this project. Um, my question to you is, is uh, like probably with many organizations at this moment, uh, over the last 12 months, it's been very demanding, probably exceptionally demanding for most, um, especially with the continuation of the need to, to, to report on SDGs, but also I understand in Ghana, uh, the census is taking place uh, and also the impacts of the global pandemic with uh, the COVID-19 situation. So where, so where do you see the data flow uh, analysis framework guidelines helping you and your organization identify areas to meet the new demands for data, including tapping into new sources or existing data within GSS that's yet to be processed or disseminated and help inform national and international policy makers? Um, thank you, Jonathan. Good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. And indeed, it's a big privilege for Ghana not just to be part of the piloting of the framework, but also to have the singular honor to write the foreword for this um, framework. Um, I look at this framework from two perspectives at the minimum before I go into the details. One, it's a framework that is going to guide all of us to help us as NSOs to increase our appreciation to get the um, public to appreciate um, what we do. Inherent in that appreciation is that this is a framework that gives us an opportunity to historically continue to store more data set and also from a diverse point of view, get access to a more integrated um, data sources. So going to your question that um, says, how do we get a sense of where this framework would help us do what we are expected to do as a national statistical office. I precede that by reflecting on what do we see ourselves as doing as a national statistical office in terms of scoping out our, the indicators that we put out on national basis. So unlike what other national statistical services do in the more developed um, countries, we have now started to think about profiling the indicators that we produce um, regularly. This is giving us a sense of the gap that we have and internally, it gives us a sense of assessing the adequacy of the indicators that we are servicing to the policymakers. Going beyond that, what we think is critical to this work is the policymakers, the users, in terms of how the external agencies are assessing the indicators that we put out there. So this framework to start with gives us an gives us the platform to sort of profile the indicators both internally and externally from the perspective of users and policymakers. We are not just profiling it, what we are doing is profiling it by the different sources and more importantly, the frequency um, and the regularity. So that is the first thing that this framework is getting us to do. Over the period, we've done user satisfaction surveys to get a sense of whether our relevance is being recognized out there. But I think what this framework is going to allow us to do is to go beyond a user satisfaction survey 
and use all the metrics that are metrics that is available with online data sets to give us a sense of whether a particular data that was produced 10 years ago is still being utilized. Because as part of the profiling exercise, we are asking ourselves in the last 10 years, what are the indicators that we've consistently produced? And then step back to two decades ago, three decades ago and ask ourselves, so for instance, with the upcoming census, one of the th key things that we're looking out for is with our first census that predates to our independence, do we have the opportunity to sort of compare indicators from our first census up until now? And this is the kind of resourcefulness that one gets to have if you work with um, a data flow analysis framework, because historically it allows you to sort of pull all that you've done over the period and you'll be able to compare over the period how things have changed. Beyond that, we in the era of administrative data and big data, for me, that is the best thing that we can do to ourselves once you have a data flow analysis framework. We are all championing administrative data. We are all championing big data. The key question here is our ability to integrate indicators across surveys, censuses, administrative data, and big data. Ahead of our census, one of the things that we're pushing hard to do is to get a sense how we're going to compare our recently conducted Ghana census of agriculture in terms of indicators with the population and housing census from a small area point of view. So indeed, digital, digitalization of the indicators really is the only option that we have to, to at, at least achieve two things. Historically compare data over time and across different data sources, you can, is, you can also assess the extent to which the indicators are comparable over time. One of the things that I want to emphasize has to do with not restricting this to the National Statistical Office. And as was mentioned earlier by, by Francois, think about this in the context of the entire um, National Statistical System. And what we are doing is we've shared this framework with them and we are beginning to tease out how we can work within the National Statistical System. And one of the things that have come up initially is two things. One is to have a competency framework that would help us bring all people on board in, in terms of how we can get to use these things. We have we started using these um, flow data flow analysis framework sometime back. It had not been documented the way it has been, but the functionality of it was really low. So we need to think about ownership, not only within the national statistical system, but ownership beyond the national um, statistical system. And that is how we intend using this framework. The other thing that we're doing to encompass the entire national statistical system is to get the code of ethics, the code of practice, which is going to be embedded in our data quality assurance framework that will be owned by the, by the entire stakeholders within the national um, statistical system. So indeed it's come to us as a great resource from the perspective of the emergence of new data sources. And that is more or less going to be the Bible that is going to guide us moving into strengthening the relevance of the Ghana Statistical Service. And for that matter, the National Statistical Office. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, you touched on some, I think some very important aspects there, uh, highlighting um, some points that I think are very sort of uh, important as we move forward and, and think about how the guidelines can evolve and also uh, be adopted and used in, in, in more countries. Um, I'll come back to you on some of those points uh, a little later, but uh, I'd like to now move to uh, Mrs. Hanta uh, Shanak, uh, if I went may. Um, and a question for you. Uh, again, uh, the Thai Statistical Office were um, also part of the pilot and, and helped to define the guidelines and including also uh, some valuable contributions from yourself. Um, so with uh, the Thai National Statistics Office being quite a large agency uh, with, a very, uh, with a very much a varying IT and tools landscape, how did the uh, DFAF guidelines help to identify and provide recommendations for reducing the maintenance overhead and build on good practices for managing IT projects? Okay, uh, thank you, Jonathan. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good, er good evening, every everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank OECD and Paris 21 for inviting Thai National Statistical Office uh, to be a part of this session. Uh, before, I an before I answer the question that uh, Thai NSO were part of the project to help refine the DFAF guidelines, uh, I would like to express my sincere 
gratitude to UNICEF Thailand for inviting the Thai NSO to join this pilot project and would like to extend this gratitude to Mr. Eve Cha from UNICEF headquarters and Mr. Jonathan uh, Sharena from OECD for the, for the analysis of the flow of data using the, uh, the FAF. The Thai NSO as a part of the pilot work held the meeting on data flow assessment for strengthening data management and dissemination on uh, November 2019. With the great help from the two experts, Mr. Eve and Mr. Mr. Jonathan, for the analysis of the Thai NSO data flow through the, uh, the Paris 21 and OCD, OECD guidelines. The objective of the analysis are to analyze uh, to analyze, to identify the current state of the data produ production, the S is in particular the data dissemination process within the Thai NSO, and second, to analyze the data flows through the statistical process, especially the data dissemination in the digital format that can be transmitted to an advanced aut automatically distributing platform, and third, less awareness of stakeholders with in the Thai NSO concerning the restrictions and the expected results after the analysis. The FAF held analyzed to identify the current data flows to the partic participation of personnel in each job family and encourage the, 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 sorry, the discussion on the content and working system that they are respons uh, responsible for in order to acknowledge the real situation. In, ad in addition, there are discussions on the direction of what we want our organization to be in the future and how to achieve this goal. We have a clear review of our organization by analyzing the data flows for both strength and area that need improvement and development for our stand, a clear direction to drive Thailand's statistical system as outlined in the Thailand Statistical Master Plan and the full support from the executives to produce statistics in accordance with international standards and best practice known as the SBPM and the modernization of digital application for the field operation data storage and service system. However, the key findings from the analysis are that we hold redundant existing silo system and we have been developing them as a silo with different people following their own mission. The lack, the lack of system integration and the enforcement mention issue is making the IT, the IT environment larger and redundant, requiring a large amount of budget for the maintenance of the whole different system. In addition, the data dissemination and mutual utilization between people in the organization and outside organizations also lack a, com a common standard of exchange. All, all in all, the FAF not only de deliver key findings on our uh, positives and negatives, but also propose recommendations to be formed as guideline or good practice to drive the organization toward our goal. From the FAF recommendations at the end of 2019, over one year and six months, the Thai NSO has made effort to develop and improve procedures as recommended by board experts, such as design the enterprise architecture in integrate all of the work system to reduce redundant and maintenance costs so that the statistics production process is harmonized and working together in unity. And second, we have a pilot promotion of the exchange of data with SDMX standards between statistical units in the country and abroad. Our first phase is to set off standards for the exchange of official statistics in the labor sector with the consultancy from the Ministry of Labor and related agency to jointly define the common uh, data structure definition or DS DSD for the crea creation of the OS gateway platform. 
And third, plan to build the SDG gateway platform to become an SDG data exchange hub based on SDMX standards with .SAT tools, supported by UNICEF Thailand, UNICEF headquarters, UNSCAP, and OECD. Uh, last, developing government data catalog that is a central source of information in the country providing users with access to single of truth data sources and metadata. This is thanks to the Paris 21 and OECD team for developing the data flow analysis framework guidelines that are very helpful to the community of statisticians and the National Statistical Office of Thailand. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I'm very pleased to hear a number of those recommendations that were made uh, actually, uh, you know, um, coming to fruitation and, and uh, being put into place by your organization. So I'm very happy to hear that. Um, next, um, uh, I would like to move to Eve uh, Jacques uh, from UNICEF. Uh, Eve, um, UNICEF has a, a very long history of supporting countries, um, including the highly successful rollout of DevInfo for the uh, Millennium Development Goals. Can you tell us what UNICEF and, and perhaps you personally also have learned from this uh, from the DevInfo experience and how you see DFAF supporting the choices NSOs have to make in regard to the adoption of standards-based processes and tools? Sure, thank you, Jonathan. And uh, thanks to Paris 21 for organizing what is a very interesting event. Uh, so DevInfo, I think, is a product that we're all familiar with. You might say it's perhaps the single best and most widely appreciated tool that the UN uh, ever put at the service of, of member countries uh, for, the, for working on data. And uh, that has to be said. At the same time, at this point, uh, it's a discontinued tool. It was part of the Millennium Development Goals. I think it served those goals extremely well. It, uh, it enabled many countries to publish their, their data to the web for the first time to also co-locate their data in a single system uh, for the first time for many of them. And that's an incredible achievement. And I think it was absolutely key to the success of the Millennium Development Goals themselves. And so we're all really happy about that. But what we realized over time was that uh, although in the short to medium term, it was an excellent product, as we started approaching the long term, there was, I would say, entropy that was creeping in in many ways uh, into the product and the initiative. And those related to some core things that, uh, that DevInfo did not do such a great job on. And so for some of those things, we would look at, for example, the fact that there was no idea of having common standards within the system in terms of how data is organized. And we did not yet have the benefit of some powerful data modeling standards such as SDMX. And so DevInfo, you might say, was uh, a kind of a wild, wild west product in which you could quite easily put data into it and publish it, which was great. But in a lot of ways, over time, it was too easy to put data in there. And so what we began to find um, are a lot of things like duplicate measurement units, duplicate codes. Uh, you start having data sets that although you would expect you could compare them easily, you no longer can because they don't match up correctly. And these are problems that you maybe didn't see in the first years, but as time goes by, then uh, these problems start to creep in further and further, making quality assurance difficult, making things like exchangeability and comparability of the data uh, more and more difficult. And on top of that, I would say that um, as a solution as well, it was uh, not part of an open source community. It was, uh, the code was managed by a single vendor and that also could create challenges in terms of how do we add new features? How do we prioritize needs of different people who are using the product uh, when we have a single source vendor? It, uh, it also became increasingly expensive for UNICEF to support the project. And uh, so we had to make the decision at a certain point to begin to uh, retire or sunset the project. But that led us to a, a big problem, which is, well, where do we go from there? And, and what lessons can we draw from, from what we learned with DevInfo so that we avoid some of the problems that we, that we had? And that's where uh, the, the work that you've mentioned 
that we've done together, together with our colleagues in UNSD, together with Paris 21, together with OECD, of course. Uh, we've also worked with other partners in the field, such as AFDB and ADB. Uh, and working together with everyone, we started to realize a, a few important things that we needed to change from how we were working in the past. And, and one thing I would very much say is uh, trying to deliver together. And for me, the community aspects of the, of the work that we've been doing, the interagency aspects of the work that we've been doing have been key to some of the successes because we not only bring more resources together, we also bring a, a wide variety of experiences. And I think those, that wide variety of experiences has, has led to a, a number of these projects being quite successful in the last few years. On top of that, we realized that uh, many people were viewing it as a technology problem that, for example, before, if I just have dev info, then my problems are solved. So it makes it appear as if it's a, a problem regarding a tool that you need to get your work done. But what we realized by working together and, and working with emerging standards such as SDMX, that it's much more an information management or a data management challenge, not so much a tools challenge. The tools help you enable the things that you should, the data that you should already be managing as well as you can. And so we really have been working hard to shift the narrative, shift the discussion towards not what's the best tool to use, but rather what's the way to organize my data such that when I put it in a tool, it will then be maintainable, it will be exchangeable, it will be comparable, it will be versionable, it will be validatable. It will have all these nice quality attributes. And that's something that comes really upstream of, of actually your tool selection. So that was um, yeah, a second thing that we learned. And then, and then I just think uh, what we've seen over the last few years are a number of interesting open source tools coming uh, online from the SISCC community, of course, uh, within which we find ourselves uh, together with OECD and a number of other partners. Uh, but also there are community additions of tools from private vendors that are partly funded from agencies, making them free to use. I'm thinking of the community edition of the Fusion Registry, for example. There are a set of very interesting tools from our partners ILO that uh, make it easy to build structures for managing your data. Uh, so I think what we find here is that there's no need necessarily to move to commercial solutions. And there's more and more strength within open source communities to build tools that we can use free of licensing restrictions that are becoming uh, easier to, to deploy and, uh, and for which there are larger and larger communities uh, of people that are working together to develop the features that are needed. So I would say that uh, it, where does DFAF come into this? I'll, I'll answer more of that in the second question, but I think for me, certainly uh, DFAF has been an important component of understanding the landscape within an NSO and seeing how that landscape can uh, be, let's say, have challenges both on technology side, but also on the information and data management sides, the way that people are working together. You could say that for me, the DFAF provides a kind of um, a business process re-engineering uh, concept to, to where the work is going. So it, it really looks at who are the people who are involved, what kind of processes are in place, what kind of products are being created. And, and by analyzing that on an abstract level, then starts to help you see where the challenges, are the challenges more on the tool side? Are the challenges more on the data and information management side? Uh, are the challenges in how people are working together? Are the problems around siloing or a lack of standards? And then this enables you to, to make the kind of choices you need to make in order to raise your efficiency and your effectiveness to deliver. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Uh, I, I, too, I, I, yeah, really a lot of the things you said have driven uh, much of what we, how we designed the DFAF, uh, thinking about standards, not looking at it as a sort of technology problem, you know, more of an information or data management problem. And the, how can we sort of uh, re-engineer, I, I suppose, business uh, processes to, to bring about efficiency? So, um, yeah, I, we'll come back to uh, another question for you after. But um, last, uh, I'd like to move to Abdullah. And um, 
maybe switch a little bit the focus more towards sort of uh, you know building on what Eve was saying around the standardization and thinking about statistical capacity and, and particularly XDMX. So um, yourself also in UNSD having supported countries in the area of statistical capacity and the use of XDMX, what are the biggest pain points you've experienced over the many years in this domain and where do you see DAF, uh, DFAF helping to identify and provide recommendations for improvements that could also lead to opportunities for increased data availability and reporting, uh, especially sort of thinking about uh, your work and, and uh, the, the global community importance of uh, SDGs. Um, thank you, Jonathan. Um, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, and good evening uh, to everyone. And uh, also thanks very much to OECD and Paris 21 for putting together this um, very useful um, framework, uh, as well as for inviting uh, me uh, to this event. Okay, so the biggest pain points uh, in terms of, you know, um, uh, implement in terms of uh, impl implementing the uh, um, uh, data exchange processing dissemination activities uh, within national statistical systems and then the international level. I think that one of the biggest pain points is not unique to statistics, and this is resistance to change. Um, this is common, obviously, to uh, all industries, and uh, we definitely experience that in statistics, but um, I will not go into detail. But the one area in statistics where resistance to change in, um, is, is very pertinent is uh, resistance to harmonization. Um, if you want to optimize your statistical business processes, if you want to avoid duplication, if you want uh, duplication of effort, if you want to streamline the processes and raise productivity, then harmonization is essential. However, um, what many people initially don't realize is that harmonization, it comes at a cost. It has a price tag attached to it. You do need to modify your processes. You do need to modify your, um, um, processing of data and so on. And then when they embark on such an exercise, suddenly that they realize that there is actually a substantial cost to harmonization. You really have to change your ways. And they see, and then they kind of often swing from one um, uh, side of the pendulum completely to the other side. So now they see all the costs and they don't see the benefits. So this is one of the uh, biggest pain points that we have seen uh, when we have worked both with the countries and international uh, agencies. There is resistance to change and there is a mis often a misunderstanding of uh, the uh, ways that harmonization uh, work. Standardization. I think it has been mentioned by almost all participants. And, um, Siloization, obviously, it uh, prevents the optimization of business processes, but what's important to understand is that siloization, it can be both horizontal and vertical. What we see is that um, very often you have thematic teams, and again, this applies uh, uh, to both uh, national statistical offices and uh, other agencies of the national statistical system and international agencies, unfortunately, uh, quite often is that thematic teams working in their particular subject matter areas, they don't talk to each other. They're not aware of really of what um, um, uh, you know, the other teams are doing. And again, that prevents the optimization of business processes. And that leads a lot of duplication of effort when, for example, different teams need to bring um, their data together. But what's also important is that civilization can be vertical as well meaning that the teams working on the different stages of GSBPM, of the statistical production cycle, um, they are quite uh, insular and they don't, don't talk to each other either. And that introduces yet another layer of um, complexity that has to be resolved, yet another layer of duplication of efforts and uh, suboptimal uh, business processes. And this is an extremely uh, pertinent one. Finally, and that goes hand in hand with the previous point is gaps in standards and technology uh, which uh, cover uh, GSBPM. In particular, the gap between microdata and uh, uh, 
uh, you know, generally teams that work in production and teams that work in dissemination. This is where, unfortunately, the links between these two organizational standards, technology, this is where we are not where we need to be. When the data flows from, I mean, because they, what we find is the production teams, their object and their focus is a particular statistical instrument such as survey or census. This is their focus. Dissemination teams, on the other hand, they are much more, um, they pay much more attention to the longer uh, time series and to stitching the data together and publishing them, uh, to identifying trends and presenting it. And these teams, they don't talk to each other, which is why very often it's uh, actually quite difficult to put together the, the um, um, statistical data sets because, for example, the surveys change a lot, uh, the questions change, um, the standards, you know, the um, approaches and uh, methodologies change, and uh, it gets very difficult in addition because of, uh, again, the, the situation is changing and improving, but standards, they don't support very well right now going from microdata to aggregated data. Um, I'm happy to say that this is being seen as a problem and this is being addressed, but this is where um, there, is, uh, there, there, there is often a gap. And uh, I mean, when you have electronic, I mean, what, what we see often is that we have electronic systems, all, you know, full featured wonderful productivity in terms of on the microdata side, and then we have wonderful tools on the aggregation, you know, on the dissemination side. But between these teams, the data flows through paper or PDF or at best Excel. So these are some of the biggest uh, pain points that, that we have seen. And uh, uh, also in terms of siloization, I think that uh, it, again, it happens horizontally, it happens vertically, it happens within the office, but it also happens between um, agencies of the national statistical system. Now, and why data, the uh, data flow analysis framework is important and where it can help. Again, I don't think I'm breaking new ground here because it has been mentioned by several speakers already, but I think that it is it can be very useful in improving the understanding of what is going on in the office and improving the big picture. Because if you look at a national statistical offices, if you look at all the links it has, both to other agencies in the national statistical systems and the, the international agencies, there are so many data flows, there are so many processes that to get a good, get a handle, to get a good understanding of the big picture is actually quite difficult. And um, um, DFAF, it helps um, to understand this. It helps um, to get the big picture. And that is, of course, the first step to improving um, uh, the business processes. So thanks to this big picture, what can be done is, what you can do is identify the areas of cooperation and potential productivity uh, gains. And this is both within the processes, uh, sorry, both within the office and externally. Because again, a statistical offices, they are uh, horizontal structures. They work with so many agencies of national statistical system that definitely uh, you can uh, um, identify as areas for improvement and um, uh, GFAF helps there. Now, we have spoken about the resistance to change and um, what can you do um, to overcome that? Well, basically there are two ways, right? There is a stick and a carrot. If you can put in the uh, legislation, if you can put in a decree of the government, and if you can, you know, have someone with a big stick threatening everyone, uh, you know, who doesn't fall in line to cooperate, then maybe you can get there. But typically, this is not how the uh, our societies and our governments work, right? And in terms of the carrot, so if you want to go the uh, the way of the carrot, which, by the way, is the only way that the UN has, unlike some uh, other international agencies, uh, then you have to convince people that the change is good, that it will bring them benefits, and that the effort that they have to put in in, in the short term is worth uh, is worth it. And this is again where DFAP, thanks to its analytical framework, thanks to its um, logical um, uh, organization and uh, the conclusions that you can produce, it can facilitate change by convincing the people within the office. Um, within the national statistical system and um, uh, at the international level that uh, the investment that is required in the short term will more than pay off uh, in the longer run. 
so this plan for reaching the state to be is um, you know um, very useful finally um, Jonathan you mentioned the SDGs and I think that the SDGs it really brings this to the fore uh, why it's because SDGs are so heterogeneous um, they basically cut across the entire national statistical system or even beyond in terms of the data that needs to be collected uh, and uh, processed and disseminated so whatever I said about uh, whatever I said previously applies to the SDG um, um, extremely um, uh, extremely strongly because it is so heterogeneous because there are so many data flows, because uh, uh, this is so difficult to process, it can be a big deal and a huge effort uh, to put together an SDG data set. And DFAR, thanks to its uh, improvement of business processes, um, can definitely facilitate uh, data exchange, data production, dissemination, and can definitely lead to improve uh, improvements in data availability and quality. Thank you. Thank you, Abdullah. So, just picking up there, I mean, you, you you talked very much about this sort of gap uh, between the, the sort of micro data level uh, and aggregated sort of dissemination of the data. And I think this also uh, speaks a lot to what um, uh, what Professor Annan was saying at the beginning, you know, about looking at new sources and and, uh, and uh, sort of digitalization and how we can work with new partners and, and sort of uh, bringing more and more data and also tap into new sources of data that maybe we, we have yet to do. So um, I'd like to go, before we move to the uh, questions from the uh, part, um, for the participants that we have um, coming in the chat, um, maybe a, a second question to you, uh, Professor Annan, is uh, to really expand on what you were talking about at the beginning, which was really, uh, you know, as I was just mentioning, um, around big data and, and new sources and how you can mobilize, uh, you know, the different stakeholders, both, um, you know, within the the NSS um, to sort of work in, in this new way and, and um, build on this, uh, especially in census and SDGs. Um, so uh, can you share with us a bit more uh, of what you were talking about in the beginning, uh, of what changes you envision in the organizational uh, setup and and, uh, and maybe also a little wider within the, the NSS um, around uh, data management practices in the age of digitalization. Um, thank you, Jonathan, once again. Um, let me indicate that we are still in motion. So most of the things that we are doing, we are just expecting that the outturn is going to be um, positive. Let me start with the organizational um, bit of it before I go into some of the examples from the perspective of censuses and administrative data. I, I, I am more inclined to say that if you are making this paradigm shift from a paper base to a digital and you want to work with your existing organogram, your that is in, um, organizational structure, your chances of succeeding might be impeded. And the reason why I say that is we previously had an organizational structure that had a whole diatribe responsible for engaging people in person and trying to respond to their data demands. And now we're moving into a system where the online, the digitalization um, bit of the work that we do to aid our dissemination is being infused into the routine work of the respective um, technical diatrates. So if we take our economic diatrates, it's not just a matter of the computation of the CPI and leaving it there. They now need to think about how they can develop interactive infographics and how they can store the data, present the data in a way that it can be compared and it can be further um, used. So my thinking, as I said initially, is that you can only ensure a success with this, with, with DFAF, if you think about reorganizing your organizational structure, and one of the examples is what I've given in terms of fusing the de um, dissemination work of a diatrate into the technical diatrate. And your entire IT structure would also have to change. So it really requires a reworking of the organizational um, structure. In terms of what we are doing with the censuses, and again, unlike previous censuses, as I indicated earlier on, we have a res results advocacy strategy and ahead of the census, we've identified over 100 indicators 
disaggregated these indicators by regions, districts, and so on. So even ahead of the censuses, one of our results advocacy strategy is to let people in Ghana international community know that the census is going to come up with over 2.6 million indicators. And again, relating this to what I said earlier on, with going back and see which of the 2.6 million indicators were collected in the previous censuses. And again, as I indicated earlier on, which other surveys and um, administrative data would complement the 2.6 million indicators that we've identified in our results advocacy strategy. So from my point of view, one of the things that we should take seriously is the roadmap that helps us to transition survey censuses from paper-based to digital, and another roadmap that helps us to transition administrative data, big data from paper to digital. And the third part that I talked about earlier on is the roadmap for integrating this. Because as has been said by all previous speakers, the key thing in here is our ability to sustain the production of the indicators in a comparable way. And that is what we are, we are doing as statistical service. One th last thing that I want to mention because I need to run away in the next minute is that we really need to start off this with a clear measure of the disconnect between what we are doing now and technology, which has already been said. Yes, we are not saying this is strictly a technology-based engagement, but the disconnect between what we are doing and the willingness of the people is one thing that we need to measure. And the other thing that we need to measure is the disconnect between what, what we are doing now and what policymakers want. Policymakers are used to speaking to them on the numbers, but with this that we are developing, it's more of self-engagement, and I'm not too sure if our policymakers are up to it now. So we need to measure that level of disconnect and also see how we can bring them on board as we transition from paper to online. And thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you for that. And I, I know we have to leave to, uh, to another meeting, so um, thank you for the response on that. We, we do have a question actually posed to you. Uh, I think mostly you probably addressed that, but um, maybe if you have sent uh, any additional points to add before you uh, have to go leave. Um, there's a question from uh, a participant um, that mentioned, you mentioned around, uh, you wished uh, this tool to be used by NSOs uh, that also cover other data producers of the national statistical system. What are the biggest challenges that Ghana's statistical services faces in disseminating data that is produced by other actors of the NSS? Thank you, Jonathan. I get Omar to speak to this. He's the person on the ground dealing with the other um, other agencies in the national studies class system. Over, Omar, over to you, please. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Yes, yeah, as uh, um, rightly indicated, uh, the first step in, in, in our context is try to identify uh, the, even the, the, the use of standard definitions, uh, um, standard concepts that aligns with the data products uh, from the, uh, the NSS, from the other line ministries. Secondly, it's not been a culture for line ministries to compile metadata to go with their data production. And so you will need to understand the metadata that goes into it, because if you are publishing data from a line ministry, you need to understand uh, some parameters around that data. And so these are some of the things that we have already identified and we started working with them. For instance, this morning, we just came back from a, a meeting with the Ministry of Education, where we realized that some of the standard definitions that we use for the census and any other data collection endeavor is completely different from what they have been used to. And so we, they are moving into the data collection uh, within the next few weeks. So we have asked them to realign that to the standard that is used in the country. That way it becomes easy uh, to engage and uh, disseminate data from this uh, institution. That will not confuse users who are used to understand things in a particular way. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. And um, so let me just introduce Omar. Omar Sidi is a um, social statistician at the Ghana Statistical Services, uh, very much also involved in the coordination work uh, for SDGs uh, in the Ghana Statistical System. So thank you for that. Um, I'd like to now move to a, a, another question, a second question also for um, uh, Ms. Uh, Hantaj Shanak. Um, just building on, on what you were talking about, uh, so you, you mentioned um, previously there's a pilot work, uh, project underway uh, for XDMX uh, data exchange. 
um, also uh, working with your Ministry of Labour. Um, I would like to maybe pose a question around, around this, uh, especially considering your long experience in, in statistical methods and standards. And, and what the uh, what your NSO has, has um, is doing in regards to, uh, or, or where would you see uh, in your organisation the need for capacities to further develop this area, um, especially in in the use of data modelling practices and standards to improve the overall quality of official statistics that TNSO are responsible for producing. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, before I answer the question. Uh, actually, I would like to ex extend my gratitude to Mr. Abdullah from UNSD for uh, helping in tininess or on data modeling SDMX for a quite long time and uh, helping us to 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 uh, make a better uh, action. So uh, uh, I will answer the question. Uh, the National Statistical Office has started SDMX related to operation since. 208, so like more than 10 years ago. The MDG indicators were exchanged via the UN uh, designated SEMX standard from the stat exchange database to UN country data in 2011. In 2014, the SEMX was developed using Eurostat tools, SEMX RI technology to disseminate official statistics. This is a trial SDMX and moving forward with the SDMX modeling workshop. Currently, we are interested in developing SDMX system using the open source .sat And we are now promoting the exchange of data on SDMX standards with official label statistics, as I mentioned before, and the measurements of the SDG indicators, as already mentioned. Uh, the requirements for the cap capacity building development on SEMX standard dice are the first, the in in, uh, sorry, in this, uh, intensive capacity building on the data modeling for Thai NSO officials. Uh, as most of the newcomers do not know SEMX and, and how to structure data in a form of SEMX standard and the technical and IT training for our IT department, which enable them to successfully create a system for enhancing data with SDMX standards and knowledge of SDG gateway system development. And, and third, the technical training on the installation and operation of that set suit. Uh, the fourth, Support from international organizations is required to continuously enable them to attend SMS related workshops or seminars for both statistics and IT departments. Uh, the guideline and standard that should be promoted to produce the official statistics with a good quality uh, are, uh, we think that we, uh, it should be the SBPM and Data Document Initiative or DDI. Uh, and then standard for exchanging statistical between agency, that means SEMX. And we have also Thailand Code of Practice. And the last, uh, the guideline standard should be promoted is standardization of the definition. That is all uh, my answer. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for that. So uh, picking up what you say, I mean, it, there's a there's a key message there, which is around uh, capacity uh, building. but also uh, the way that agencies uh, interchange and work with you um, to coordinate maybe that capacity building in a, in a sort of um, coherent way, uh, bringing in their, level, their different areas of expertise for, for the benefit of your organization. So um, this actually um, uh, leads to uh, another question which I have for, for um, Eve from UNICEF. Um, and where, where do you see uh, DFAF changing the way in which development partners, including solution providers, approach uh, different activities such as what uh, Ms. Hantaj Shanok was just explaining about, um, the, in the national statistics systems, uh, especially to support and improve data availability and reporting at a global level? Thank you, Jonathan. I, I think I'll 
probably be repeating some things that other panelists have been saying as well. Um, but what I want to say with respect to the DFAF is that it, um, well, first, I see it as coming from a long history of uh, analytical frameworks to, to understand how we work together. So things like business process reengineering, various project management methodologies, um, things like SWOT analyses and gap analyses. It's very much in that spirit. And those are things that I've always really appreciated. You know, how, how, do we look, how do we look at something as a process that we can improve? It, it also leans on standards uh, such as the generic statistical business process model, uh, the generic statistical information model. And uh, so I think you know, it, it, it's, it has a long history behind it and it leans on a number of good standards uh, in this organization. And this is all around, I think, what's been a long running conversation around the industrialization of statistics. So how do we, how do we treat statistics in a way as just another product, let's say, uh, it's a data product. And, and that's where it gets really interesting when you look at an NSO. I think of an NSO as being a kind of data factory. And, but the, and, and just like, let's say it's a car factory, uh, a car manufacturer doesn't build all their own parts. They get some bolts from over here and some belts from over there and, uh, and, and they put the things together and they end up with a car. Um, an NSO in, in many ways is in a similar position. It has a whole set of suppliers that deliver it data. The NSO might make some data itself, but a lot of the data it's relying on is provided by other agencies within the national statistical system, other ministries and so on. And these are very much like suppliers providing nuts and bolts and belts. And the challenge being that uh, in many cases, the, the NSO maybe doesn't have, a, let's say, as strong of an authority to get those statistics as we might like. So on the one hand, the NSO is, is, uh, has this official role of being the coordinator of the national statistical system, but they often don't have the accompanying kind of authority to get those numbers uh, in the way they would like to get them at the, the rate they would like to get them using the kind of standards they would like to get them. And so as, as Abdullah was saying, uh, you know, change management and working, changing the way people work is the most difficult part in, in any organization and, and whether it's public or private. And I think for an NSO, it's compounded by the fact that often the NSO doesn't have the authority to force someone to change. And so what the DFAF does, I think, is give a really nice sort of lay of the land. What is the current situation? Who's providing data? When do they provide it? How do they provide it? What are the chat? What formats does it come in? You know, where is it easy to work with? Where is it difficult to work with? And so that, that gives this you know, external picture of the national statistical system and the NSO's engagement with it. And then it goes even further and also takes a really strong look at how is that data then handled internally as the data products are being built? And so that's why I, I personally see the, the DFAF as being so incredibly useful is, is it shows this kind of cross, cross agency, cross ministry, cross domain kind of work that an NSO does and helps to understand where the bottlenecks and the friction points are and, and where things can be improved. Uh, with, you know, without saying that things are wrong or right, it's just, here's what it looks like Here's where we're having some troubles. What can we do to make it better? And it, and it has this, you know, kind of a industrialization of statistics idea behind it. And um, I think that's, uh, that's really what I'd like to say that I, I personally learned uh, from working with the DFAF. And it, similar to experiences that I have within UNICEF myself, in that being an agency that works across many different sectors, you know, education, immunization, child health, child poverty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We, we're very much like an NSO within the UN in that we rely on data from other agencies such as WHO or World Bank or UNPD and so on. And uh, so, so I'd say we, we have some of the similar challenges of working across agencies and across sectors and, and trying to get people to work together. So for me, uh, I even use DFAF concept myself to understand how we are working together or not and where the challenges are and how our data moves through the system. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, maybe just, I mean, it's a similar question, Abdullah, to you, but maybe just to build on some of the things that um, um, Eve was saying from a UNSD perspective, 
what, how, how do you see uh, development partners such as yourself supporting NSOs to realize their investments in IT infrastructure, um, which, which, needs, which are, uh, meets the needs of its beneficiaries, for example? Well, I think actually the answer to that is straightforward, but it's not a, a simple one. And uh, this goes back to what you was talking, I was saying about DevInfo. The issue is that um, I think that where what what is lacking, what skills are lacking, what 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 needs to be done at national statistical offices is. Um, data management. This is where capacity needs to be built. Because um, what pe many people, they don't understand the complexity of data management and the inherent complexity of highly disaggregated data sets, uh, such as the SDGs, but not the only SDGs, uh, you know. Um, it, this is not trivial. People need to be trained. People need to be um, taught how to use the tools and people need to get experience with the data management. And this is not something that any single international organization can do. We at UNSD, we have, we have been helping the countries a lot, particularly in the, in the areas of uh, the MDGs uh, or the SDGs. But if we're talking about, uh, for example, agricultural data, um, then we cannot, uh, we, we cannot help much. This is not uh, kind of our uh, area of expertise. This is where would be, we would be looking at FAO. Um, provide training to the people in how properly to manage agricultural data, what the concepts are, what the code lists are, what the areas are. Um, we would look to UNICEF to provide, uh, of course, um, uh, help with uh, uh, child uh, and um, uh, maternal uh, indicators and so on and so forth. What the development partners can do is organize themselves in the first place to coordinate a push to create capacity at national statistical offices for data management. This is what is needed. And uh, only then can you realize the benefits of technology because without the skills, without the capacity in data management, technology will not help. Technology is there, but uh, it needs to be properly used. Thank you. Maybe uh, staying with you, Abdullah, um, may maybe there's a question from uh, the audience. Um, how can, I think, I mean, you, you probably spoke a lot on this uh, around uh, data sort of standardization and, and, and harmonization, but how can data modeling practices help in this regard? Help with uh, standardization? So uh, overall, if you think about data management uh, within the NSO and, mm. uh, and, and sort of making more data available, et cetera, you know, all the things that we've touched upon in, in this discussion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, well, data management starts with data modeling, doesn't it? Um, you need to create a model for your data before you can manage that. Um, how can it help? Well, I think that actually uh, if might say a few things about this because they underwent a similar uh, process in the last couple of years. But you need to sort out your data. You need to understand how you can represent the data and how to make sure that your data is uniformly represented across your statistical subject matter domains in the first place. That, for example, um, if you need to use your province codes, then you use the same province codes uh, across uh, your um, NSO in the first place and national statistical system ideally uh, later on, because this does not always happen. If you have indicators to ensure that the same codes are used, and if you have concepts to represent um, health, for example, that the same concepts are used in the case of, uh, by, by the Ministry of Health, by the national statistical offices and um, uh, National Institute of Health, for, uh, for example. Um, this is essential. Um, this is the most, it is not easy, but this is the, the essential step towards, uh, you know, optimization of the business processes and making the data available. Because by standardizing the data, by using uniform concepts, by un using uniform codes, um, this is how you greatly facilitate the consumption of your data by your users. And speaking of which, SDMX, if we if if mention SDMX, it, it can help there, but it's just a technology, it's a tool. However you optimize your business processes, you will end up with the same 
issues, regardless of which technology or which standard you use. It's it's, it's not a choice of uh, using as you know you know uh, of uh, doing the data management or not doing the data management. You have to do it anyway, and uh, the complexity is there anyway. And standards such as SDMX, which come now uh, with a lot of tools attached that can simplify your work, they can facilitate it, but they cannot take away the complexity. Thank you. Uh, Eve, would you have anything to add to Abdullah's uh, points there? Sure, just one, one point that uh, I think has always been important for me, and this was also working with various national partners who were looking to migrate off of DevInfo, uh, we found that you know, it's, it's a pretty big job. It's mostly a data and information management job. So you, you get the data out of DevInfo and then you find that you have all kinds of duplicate code values and so on and so forth. And you need to spend time with technical sectors to essentially remodel that data. And, and it turns out to be actually a really healthy exercise in that the, the sector specialists are the ones who know the most about their own data. And so by making it a data and information management challenge, you put the data back where it belongs in the hands of the sector specialists and you try and you know, abstract the IT part away as much as you can. Now, the benefit of having standards behind the work that you're modeling or, or the data that you're managing is that you do get, in, at least in some cases, an ecosystem of tools that know how to talk to each other. And for me, this has been one of the great benefits of SDMX uh, is that by having our data in SDMX, we can move it from one tool to the next. And in fact, we do that. We, we use both .stat suite as part of the SISCC community. And we also use the Fusion Registry, which is another similar SDMX pr product. And we can seamlessly move data and structures and codes between the two of them with almost no friction. And uh, I think this is, one of the underlying benefits of standards is that they make it the, so that you, you avoid being locked into tools. Uh, if you're on a commercial tool, you can avoid being locked into a certain vendor. And this is, uh, to me, one of the other important and, and often ignored aspects of centering on, on standards that have ecosystems of tools that support them. Thank you for that. Um, we have one more question from uh, the audience I think we can have time for. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I think this is probably back to you even, and, and maybe Abdullah even, here's uh, DDI versus XDMX. So would it be correct to put much more emphasis on DDI with regard to data exchange inside the national statistical system since XDMX mainly focuses on cubes? So uh, maybe uh, Abdullah, you would like to go on this one? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh I think that rather the distinction between a DDI and SDMX is DDI is primarily for modeling uh, microdata, whereas SDMX is primarily for aggregated data. So I think that this is a more pertinent uh, distinction than between uh, exchange within the national statistical system or the outside. In this context, um, SDMX 3.0 is going to feature rich support for microdata, and it's going to make data exchange uh, easier because DDI is uh, was developed for more for data modeling, less for data exchange. SDMX was always from the start for data exchange, so now they it can support it will support micro data exchange as well. But these standards they are not mutually exclusive; they are actually complementary. Sorry, thank you for that, Abdul. Um, I think we're, we're getting close to the end of time and I want to give Lee some time for the wrap up. But before we do, um, I, I would like to just go uh, around each of the panel members and maybe within you know, 30 seconds or maximum of a minute, uh, please share your biggest piece of advice to other organizations that are listening today and, and maybe contemplating carrying out a data flow analysis. So I'll start with uh, Ms. Uh, Antai uh, Shanak, please. I'm sorry, can, can you give me a question, please? Yes, so in, in, one, in 30 seconds, can you just please share your biggest piece of advice to other organizations that might be listening today that uh, would be contemplating carrying out a data flow analysis, such as what was carried out in uh, the Thai Statistical Office? 
uh, actually, I, I would like to thanks and I would like to share uh, later uh, what what are we uh, what AI it is are going to do. Uh, as, as I mentioned you before that uh, we we face a problem with a new uh, how to say new era. So we we can uh, digital change really quick. I mean the IT and we have so many uh, new requirements from the user and the government agency. So so we have to to look look to reorganize our uh, our uh, how to say our NSO. That that is I would like to share, and then I will share what what we are, what we will improve after this uh, to all of the international agency and to the other NSO other country. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Eve. Over to you on this question. Same question to you. Sure. Thanks, Jonathan. Well, one thing I think is very important is to, when approaching it, not view it as um, as a document that is going to show who's doing things great and who's not doing things great. And, you know, it's, it's not a competition. And I think what we find within a lot of agencies, UNICEF included, is that we have different groups working in different areas and maybe, you know, some of them think they're the best and other, thing, other ones think they're the best and so on. And that's not the purpose of, of this work at all. It's really to, to do a, a best honest job of documenting the landscape the people, the processes, the products, how things are moving. And it really is, has nothing to say about whether things are being done correctly or incorrectly. It's, it's to really understand what the picture looks like so that you can then make a series of decisions about how to work better together. Thank you, Eve. Um, Omar, uh, to you as well, please. Thank you. Yeah, so our approach to this has been a holistic approach, and we believe that operationalizing the, uh, the DFAF uh, is, is something that you have to be taken on board along with um, the IT infrastructure assessment. Uh, we have just completed the IT infrastructure audit to understand um, the data security system set up within the NSO to receive a huge data from the other members of the NSS, also the establishment of the data quality assurance framework, uh, establishment of uh, data pipelines to ensure that uh, we data move from the uh, line ministries seamlessly to within the NSO and also uh, the production of metadata because that is very important because embedded in the metadata compilation is the use of standard definitions and concepts. And so this has been our approach and we're hoping that soon we'll be sharing our story with others. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. And I'm very happy to hear you mention metadata there. I think it's a very uh, um, interesting topic and, and very sort of, um, important topic that we will, especially in the world of standardization and next MX, that's really sort of starting to evolve uh, into, into a, a good, uh, good way forward. So, um, Abdullah, last uh, but not least, please, uh, same question to you as well. You're on mute. Uh, sorry, I would just like to echo the comments that uh, have been uh, said already. I think it's a very, very, DFAF is a very useful tool that can, again, help you understand what is going on uh, in the office, help you uh, understand um, the areas that need improvement and actually go ahead and improve uh, uh, those areas. And what I think, what I hope, uh, can evolve, can, uh, it can grow into is sort of a collection of best practices because this is just a stepping, so this is just a framework, but then as the various organizations um, um, follow this framework, they will face similar challenges, they will try to overcome them and gradually you can compile, um, a, I wouldn't say a manual, but a set of best practices that you can do to uh, optimize a business process in your office. So this, I think this is where its potential long-term impact can be quite um, uh, significant. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, we've come to the end of the panel now. Um, I would like to thank everyone here, a panelist for a very, very interesting discussion and all their uh, contributions to the uh, discussion today. And and uh, also the um, audience for their questions that we'll post. And uh, we answered as many as we could. I think there's some uh, that we remain, but we'll, we'll try to follow up on those um, after the, uh, the webinar. 
Um, so I now hand back to Rajiv. And again, I think let's give the panelists a round of applause uh, for the uh, virtually. And um, over to you, Rajiv. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Um, it was a wonderful um, um, uh, kind of uh, panel discussion, well moderated, uh, um, very good insights. I gathered three uh, takeaway and um, like people, uh, uh, process and technology. Um, and then uh, the capacity development is on the people side, uh, definitely the technology to enable the processes um, and uh, enable uh, the, the, the processes which are required in the digital era. So perfect uh, uh, segue to the uh, concluding session of this webinar. Um, uh, we have Eric uh, Anwar here. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, he is not only the head of smart data at OECD, but um, he's mainstreaming the um, OECD smart data strategy within the uh, in, in the OECD's work which basically means that uh, uh, to look at not only the technology aspect, but also the process aspects. So I, I think uh, uh, this is uh, something that uh, kind of uh, links very well with a broader discussion that we are having here in, in this uh, webinar. So um, Eric, uh, over to you uh, for your uh, remarks. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Rajiv, and, and, and thank you all for uh, this, uh, this great seminar. I think it was extremely rich. Uh, it was great to have so many of you from all the parts of the world uh, interested in this work. And, and of course, special thanks to the panelists and all the speakers for, uh, I think, really the invaluable insights. Uh, and uh, so it's quite challenging to try to summarize uh, a couple of takeaways that I noted throughout the discussions and, uh, and then also conclude with a, a call for actions. Um, listening to you know, these uh, exchanges, this uh, reminded me of a, a Sufi tale that I think many of you probably know. This is the story of an elephant that is locked in a, in a dark stable and people would uh, go into the stable and, and try to uh, define what this animal is. And so one of them would come out uh, saying that, uh, well, elephant is an animal with a long nose. Another one would define elephant as uh, the animal with very large uh, ears. Another one like the animal with uh, legs like pillars, etc., etc. And of course, uh, the, the story uh, here is about the, the notion that there is a reality, but there are very fragmented views uh, of, of that reality. And and trying to bring about a common representation of the problem is in fact uh, uh, perhaps the essence and the first step in, in whatever strategy we, we undertake. And I think DFAF is really precisely about that. Um, it's really about bringing uh, to life a common representation uh, of the particularly uh, complex problem that NSOs and, and statistical ecosystems at large are trying to solve and bringing together stakeholders uh, around this common representation in a way that is conducive to concrete actions. Uh, and I think the discussions today really illustrated how, how useful in that regard DFAF uh, can be. Uh, what also struck me is the notion that uh, this is about really enabling integration and uh, uh, delivering together, to use Eve's word, in the broader sense. Uh, so moving away, of course, from fragmentation, silos, uh, et cetera. And this notion of you know, better integration and, and delivering together can be, uh, I think, uh, looked at from different angles. And uh, I think the panelists really illustrated that quite richly in, in a, from multiple uh, dimensions. Uh, there was this notion that was uh, uh, emphasized at the beginning uh, by Samuel, the notion of uh, uh, including the views of data users into uh, the data production uh, factory. Uh, seems like an obvious statement, but uh, as it was said, uh, this is a lot more than just carrying out the satisfaction survey. Uh, later on, there was this idea that we need to bring the views and the experience of all the players involved in the data cycle in the larger ecosystem, uh, especially the national uh, uh, statistical ecosystem, in a way that there is a common awareness of problems and issues, and hence the possibility of a coordinated effort to change uh, and, and deliver together. That's one, one aspect you know, uh, from, from which you could uh, sort of define this notion of better integration and, and delivering together. The other obvious, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, way of defining that is, is data integration. Uh, so data flow analysis is really about data integration, uh, which is the cornerstone 
to uh, make possible, for example, the integration of new data sources in uh, the development of official statistical product. Uh, uh, the point that was made uh, several times, and uh, including by Abdullah, on the importance of harmonization and standardization, the practice of data modeling and SDMX was uh, repeated a, a number of times. Uh, and, and in a way, data modeling has a central capacity that can enable uh, data integration. Another way of interpreting this notion of better integration and, and delivering together is, uh, of course, uh, uh, what was also mentioned several times in terms of uh, a smoother and more efficient data process. Uh, so how can we better identify roadblocks uh, as a first step uh, so as to be able to address them uh, by calling more attention, bringing more resources into where the pain really are. And uh, the experience uh, that was shared by some of the panelists demonstrated that sometimes the real problem is not that visible. And we are very much uh, uh, sort of mesmerized by the technology or the tool uh, issues and not seeing, of course, the, the human aspect, you know, the cultural, organizational uh, skills, et cetera, which in a way are, are, are potentially the, the, the most, uh, I would say, difficult part of the problem that we, we are trying to solve. So this notion of industrialization, of course, uh, came across a, a number of times. So this is a really, I think, uh, a rich uh, exercise with, with a lot of potential uh, that has delivered value already uh, on the ground. And now, now I would like really to conclude uh, with this uh, call for action, uh, uh, we, you, uh, uh, we all can play a role in this in this story. Uh, if this initiative uh, you deem useful and you believe can help you address some of your issues uh, as an NSO or as a, a data development partner, uh, please uh, join in. Help us grow and improve the guidelines. Uh, uh, bring these guidelines and uh, the DFAF uh, and the principles that go with it into the the relevant circles of collaboration where it can bring value. Uh, and I would like here to especially emphasize uh, uh, three ways uh, that uh, we think you, you, you could contribute. Uh, one is uh, for countries or development partners interested to work uh, with DFAF in uh, the, the coming month. Uh, you are warmly invited to send us uh, expression of interest or even um, if you are seeking, of course, support and ideas, uh, don't hesitate to contact us. Secondly, uh, especially, of course, uh, countries who are interested and sort of willing and decided and able to carry out DFAF under their own initiative uh, are more than welcome to uh, share their plans uh, and or uh, during uh, and or after completion of the assessment, bring back feedback so that we can enhance uh, uh, DFAF as part of an ongoing, I would say, uh, evolution and improvement of the guidelines. Uh, and in general, I mean, all of, all of the participants, all of you, you are welcome to, to bring feedback uh, uh, to help us bring further improvement and, and perhaps on the, on the long term bring, bring about a, a DFAF, let's say, community of practice, perhaps down the road on, on the longer term horizon. Uh, and when I'm saying uh, uh, stand back to us, by that I mean uh, especially Paris 21. Uh, and I will put in the chat uh, um, the address or of uh, Paris 21, where you are very welcome to, to bring uh, your, your feedback and, and contribution. Uh, so with that, uh, let me again uh, thank uh, very much uh, the organizers, uh, the panelists, the speakers, and all the participants for their excellent question. Uh, and, and now close the session and you know, looking forward to hear uh, from, from you all in the, in the coming weeks and months. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks so Thank much. You. Bye bye. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.